Well, welcome everyone to Hope Church and Happy Easter. I thought that was a good way for us to begin this morning. A treat if you're here slightly early. Um, you get to begin with a great Easter hymn. And it's great to see more people back with us today. We're using uh, all the rooms in the building, I think, now. Uh, but whether you're here or watching later at home, what I want us all to understand today is the, is the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus why we can rejoice together. Understand the reality, the fact of Jesus' resurrection and how that changes everything. And that's hope for us, um, even in a society um, facing a coronavirus crisis and a socially distant world. That's This hope in Jesus is precisely for us at this time. Let's remind ourselves of these words of this uh, great uh, hymn from Charles Wesley. Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. All creation joined to say, Hallelujah. Vain the stone, the watch, the seal. Christ has burst the gates of hell. Death in vain forbids him rise. Christ has opened paradise. Lives again our glorious King. Where, O death, is now your sting? Once he died, our souls to save. Where's your victory, boasting grave? Saw we now where Christ has led, following our exalted head. Made like him, like him we rise. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies. Well, let's now read of the events in Jerusalem on Sunday, April the 5th, AD 33, that give rise to that hope that was written about in that hymn. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Well, let's come to God in prayer now and ask that he would help us to remember these words, to understand what Jesus did that day. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come before you today rejoicing. We thank you that this uh, is the first time for some who have been able to join with us for a long time. We thank you that we can be together in this way. And we thank you that we can rejoice in what you have done. Thank you that the Lord Jesus, your Son, is alive today. We thank you that the Saviour who suffered and died to rescue sinners is alive today as our exalted head. He is the one who has gone through death for us. He has conquered death for us and we can now share in his life, even now. And that gives us such comfort and hope in a world that is full of turmoil. We're conscious of the suffering around us, the different suffering we have been through. And we thank you that you know all about us this morning. We don't need to explain everything to you. You see inside our hearts. And we thank you that you are the God who can minister to us according to our need. And we pray that you would help us all to know the Lord Jesus today to see how he is the answer, that we would remember his words, to see that life is found in him. Heavenly Father, make these things real to us today. Show us how what Jesus did there matters for us now. And we ask it in his name. Amen.
all. Many of you know I've been doing um, some different things over the last, uh, last few months uh, alongside my work for the church. And, and I was thinking, well, may maybe it's time for me to find a totally different job. Maybe I should get a job in advertising. So I'm wondering, what do you, do you, maybe you can have a look at the, the sort of my portfolio I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you some examples of some of my advertising, and you can decide whether you think this would be a good career move. So here we go. Here's, here's, here's number one. Thought I'd go into the, uh, the, the travel business. Book now, day trips to Mars. And those of people from the sort of same era as me might recognize the slogan at the bottom, which I've nicked from, of course, the Mars bars back in the 1980s, a Mars a day helps you work, rest, and play. Um, so maybe a trip to Mars can do the same. What do you reckon about this? How, how, how convincing is this as, as an advert? It's good. OK, well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I feel flattered. Do you detect a slight problem with this advert? A day. Right, yeah, it takes, I think, at least a year to get to Mars. Um, you certainly can't get there in a day, and certainly can't get there and back. It's, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, a, a year-long trip to Mars, that would be pushing things a bit, actually. But a day trip, well, that's just ridiculous. Let's, uh, let's try another, another one of my adverts. Thought I'd go into the used car business, classic models at rust bottom prices. Now, you know, the, the, they're stopping production of the Ford Mondeo, so I thought, well, this is the time to get hold of a second hand one. Could be valuable in, in years to come. And um, you see, with this model, you can save on tyres, you don't have to worry about tyre wear. Um, guaranteed it won't be stolen, um, you can be sure, sure of that. And this is a special Flintstone model. Again, people of a certain era will remember, will know what I mean by that. Um, it's where you power it yourself, um, pushing along with your legs. And the engine is optional. So, how, how, good is, how good is this, do you think? This is bad. Why is it bad? Sorry? The car's really old and it's broken. It's basically totally useless, isn't it? Yeah? So this is, this is rubbish, okay? The previous one was ridiculous. Well, this is just rubbish. It's of no use at all. You can dress it up in as fancy language as you like, but this is, this is of no use. So I thought, well, okay, let's try moving into the catering business. Let's get natural. Let's get back to nature with our special salad and slug side dish. Come on, we all want to be um, natural and healthy. What's the problem with this one? Or maybe you like it, I don't know. You don't like lettuce? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very good one, yeah. That's one thing that's unattractive. What's the other thing? I think this <laughs> so, so if the slug was dead, would it be all right? <laughs> I think the slug is alive, actually, yeah. Um, but alive or dead, um, it's not very attractive. Um, so this is just revolting, okay? Yuck. This isn't going to be attractive. So, should I, uh, should I change jobs? Or maybe I shouldn't ask that question. You might think I should by the end of the service. But um, put it a different way. Should, should I go into advertising? Well, probably not. Not if this is going to be my approach. So why am I doing all this? Well, here's my question this morning. How did the church get here? I think we can all agree that, that we are here this morning along with millions of other Christians around the world meeting together. Where did the church come from? Well, what some people would like to say is that, yeah, there, there was this person, Jesus of Nazareth, and there were some people that were close to him, and they basically beefed up all these stories about him to, to try and make out he was someone extra, extraordinary, to try and get a big following. Essentially, all these people that became Christians in the, in the early, early centuries were deceived by clever advertisers. That's sort of how the story, maybe you've heard people say things like that or even thought that yourself. You know, this, okay, maybe this person, Jesus, but it all just got inflated. It was all just advertised and made up. 
Well, I want to show you why that doesn't work. Because the sort of things that they were saying were, wouldn't be attractive. It was absolutely not the way to start a new religion. This, the sort of things they were saying were exactly not the sort of things people wanted to hear. So it wasn't that they had a focus group and said, OK, what is all the things that people would like in a new religion? OK, let's go and put that into Christianity. It was almost the exact opposite of that. Because what were the big claims that they were making? Well, the first thing they said was that Jesus is God. And that is something that on the face of it sounds ridiculous. You even had someone who was Jesus' brother, James, who was, became the leader of the church in Jerusalem, who was saying that his brother, Jesus, was God. An incredible claim. And if you were trying to say this to the Jewish people, they would say, but hang on a minute, there's one God, and the whole point about God is that you can't see him. You mustn't make any image of God. You can't see God. So how can this person that walked the streets with us be God? That's crazy. And then if you were talking in the Roman world, we well, might think, well, they, they believed in lots of gods, didn't they? You know, they even said the emperor was God. But you know, that isn't... What they meant by that was very different to what the Christians were saying about Jesus. No one ever claimed that the emperor had created everything, was the absolute ruler of the whole universe. No one ever thought that about the emperor, but that is what was being claimed about Jesus, that this person that had been living among them was the person that had made the entire universe, made them, and was in control of everything. It's an incredible claim. Second thing that they said was that Jesus, the Messiah, was crucified. Now, the problem here was not being crucified in the sense that everyone knew Jesus had been crucified. The problem was, well, how could he then be the Messiah? Because the Messiah meant this special promised king who would come and rescue his people. And for that, you need someone strong. You need someone victorious. A crucified Messiah is a useless Messiah, is how people would think, just like that car that I showed you. And for the Jewish people, to be crucified meant you were under God's curse. So how on earth could this person be the Messiah? And for the Romans, to talk about crucifixion, well, people would sort of choke on their food. This was, this was not something you would mention. You know, if you talk about crucifixion at school, you got told off. This isn't something you talk about. It was something deeply humiliating. Because the, the Romans would put their enemies on crosses, leave them there to die, precisely to tell people, look, this is what happens to you if you try and uh, rebel against us. You're going you're, you're to be left helpless dying on a cross. If you like, crucifixion was the ultimate proof that Rome was in charge, that Rome had won. And now you're coming along and saying, this person, Jesus, is actually the ruler of everything, who's just, be, who's just died on a cross. That seems like a crazy message. And don't take my word for it. Here is some graffiti. You know, graffiti is not new. This is some graffiti from the second century in Rome. And uh, on, the, on the left there is what it looked like on the, on the stone, and the, the right is a sort of redrawing of it so you can see it more clearly. And the writing with it goes like this. It says, Alex Amenos worshipping his God. And what's Alex Amenos doing? He's looking up at a figure of someone on a cross. And can you see what the head of that person is on the cross? What do you say, Liz? A horse, yeah. Any other ideas? It's a, sorry? A giraffe? It does look a bit like that, actually. Um, it's actually a donkey. So don't think there's anything new about being mocked as a Christian. People were doing this back in the second century. They were saying that basically a saviour on a cross, you might as well worship a donkey, is what they were basically trying to say with this bit of graffiti. They were mocking this as just something utterly ridiculous. So to try and start a new religion with this message that Jesus the Messiah was crucified was not the way to do it. Okay? That, you'd be, be sacked if you were 
It's doing this as an advertising agency. And the third thing that they claimed was that Jesus' body was raised from the dead. Jesus was raised from the dead physically. Okay, it wasn't just a sort of spiritual resurrection, but a bodily resurrection. And the reaction to this would have been a bit like the reaction to what I showed with the salad and the slug. It would have been yuck. This is something really rather distasteful. Because in that culture, the, the body was something to escape from. Who wants to come back to a new life in, in a body? No, we want to escape from all of that. This is something very unattractive. Sometimes we think, oh, the resurrection message, that must have been attractive. Actually, it wasn't. And in a funny sort of way, we actually think quite similarly today. Our bodies cause us lots of problems, don't they? Do you ever worry about how you look? Do you ever worry about illness or injury? Do you hear people saying things like this, that they're trapped in the wrong body? It's a problem with our body. And so actually, we're thinking like this, just like they were in those days. Aren't we almost better off without our bodies? Let's try and escape our bodies, the limitations our bodies brings. Who wants a bodily life after death. So this message that Jesus has come back to life with this new real body was something very unattractive. And, and for the Jews, it was also rather strange. They did believe in some sort of idea of a resurrection, but it was very much at the end of history. It was all rather different to what happened to Jesus. And, and to cap it all, if you're going to come along with this doctrine of, of Jesus being raised from the dead... The last thing you're going to do is say, yeah, the first people that saw Jesus were the women. Because their testimony was not accepted in court in the culture of that time. That isn't something you would make up, because it wouldn't have counted for anything. That wouldn't have been good advertising. So, this whole idea that uh, Christianity was somehow sort of invented to be something attractive to gain a following is utter nonsense because all the things that they were claiming were actually very unattractive. So the only way this can possibly work, the only way that people would actually become Christians would be if this was actually true. If actually they couldn't explain any other way why the tomb was empty and why people had seen Jesus except that he had risen from the dead for all the questions and problems that might bring, this did really happen that he really was, he really did win as he died on the cross. That actually, the only way we can explain this person, Jesus, and all the things he did is that actually he really was God. And so that is why the church is here today. It's not that they had some clever advertisers. It's that it's based on what is true. So let's read a bit more now um, from from Luke, more of the evidence that Jesus is alive. And here we're, we, we read the beginning of the chapter at the start of the service, and um, after that it talks about a time where two people travelled from Jerusalem and they ended up talking, without realising it, to Jesus himself, who explained to them just what had been going on. And so we pick up the, the story now where says they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, that's, that's the disciples, the, the, the people that were following Jesus most closely. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, 
do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Well, let's come to God again in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have in your word Jesus' own explanation of his life, his death, and his resurrection. And we ask that you would help us this morning to listen to his words, to see that what he did then matters for me today. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us by your spirit. We pray that Jesus' words would go deep in our hearts and that his words would bring new life to us. May we know him as our saviour today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before we look more at what Jesus said there to his disciples, uh, we're going to sing, well, we're not, we're going to listen to a song, uh, a resurrection song, See What a Morning, and this is one of the uh, recordings um, from church in Hayes Lane in Bromley um, that have done for the, been done for the, for the service of the churches and we're really grateful for that. Um, we have one right at the start of the service and uh, here we go.
pandemic, many people are dying around the world. And for all the progress there's been, there's still a long way to go before anything like normality returns. There is still some sense of crisis. And it's not the only crisis, is there? There's a social crisis. Think of the inequality in our world, the racism, the violence against women, sexual abuse and exploitation. Think of the environmental crisis. Think of the damage being done to our planet. Think of the health crisis. Think of the needs of, in social care, in mental health and many other things. Just think of what goes on around the world today. In this country, in other countries, the injustice, the abuse of power, the war, the terrorism. Democracy on retreat in many places. We're in a world with all these sorts of problems, almost drowning in these problems, and we're spending Sunday morning talking, singing, well, okay, we can't sing, about Jesus. How on earth does that help? What possible relevance does that have? Surely this is just some sort of escapism. You know, we're in the midst of a messed up world, so we're just trying to sort of draw aside from that, forget that, and let's um, think about some happy things. What possible relevance does Jesus of Nazareth have to me today? To the problems we face, to the problems that I face. Why is Jesus relevant? Maybe you're thinking, you know, or heard people say, you know, look, don't go on about all this Jesus stuff. I'm, I'm just too busy. I've got too many of my own problems to deal with. Now understand, it's not that the problems in society, in the world, and indeed in your life, are not big problems. I'm not saying actually those things are small things, but, but try and make a bit of room for Jesus too. That isn't what I'm saying. I'm saying that Jesus is relevant precisely because he is the answer to all of those problems and a whole pile of other ones you haven't even realized. In fact, to say that Jesus isn't relevant is as bizarre as a starving person asking what, what the relevance of a food parcel is. It's utterly crazy. He is the most relevant person there could ever be. Well, maybe your reaction is a little bit different. You're thinking, well, actually, I'm okay. I'm not someone in great need. And yeah, I know lots of people have suffered a lot in this crisis, but, but actually, I've, I've done all right. Um, I'm actually pretty happy. I certainly don't need a saviour from anything. Well, can I suggest this as a reason in the first place why you should also listen today? However great your life is, it will end. You will die. So to talk about someone who has gone through death and been raised to a new kind of life, never to die again, surely is something pretty relevant to every one of us, however good or bad your life might be at the moment. Surely this is someone we should at least give a hearing to. We need to listen to him. So what we're going to do is look at Jesus' own words to his disciples, what he explained to them two days after he had died on a cross. This is incredible. This same person they saw die on a cross, this is what he said to them two days afterwards. He appears to them and says, it is I myself. It's me. What's all that about? Well, who is this person? Who is Jesus? Well, it's very clear from what he just said there that he knows who he is. Here is someone very sure of his own identity. Incredible, isn't it? Despite the trauma of what he'd been through, even in the immediate days preceding, the midnight trials, the beating and flogging, the crucifixion, there's no, there's no post-traumatic stress disorder in Jesus. Rather, Jesus is the one who's reassuring the disciples. You know, Jesus has been through all of that, and he is the one who's reassuring his disciples. This is the Jesus the disciples knew before. 
This was someone who was never unsure of himself. <clears throat> he never needed to sort of find himself or he never needed the validation of others. There was never any sense of purposelessness or meaninglessness in his life. Here was someone always totally secure in himself <clears throat> in a deeply attractive, not arrogant way. Jesus was someone that would give you confidence. He gave you confidence to be with him precisely because he was utterly sure of who he was and what he was doing there. And particularly as he appears to the disciples now, I want you to notice this. Jesus is comfortable in his own skin, literally. He is here in a real body. This is not some sort of spiritual resurrection. He goes to great pains to make that clear. This is not some sort of ghost they're seeing. Rather, Jesus comes along and he speaks. He's, he's rather sort of proud of his body. That is quite something. He, he doesn't say anything like, you know, I've got the wrong body, guys. No, he, he, he shows his hands and his feet. Compare that to the to the issues that we have with our bodies today. Think of the amount of angst there is over body image in our world. Jesus didn't have that. Which of us could ever say we are totally happy with our bodies, totally happy with how they look and how they function? None of us. And yet Jesus is perfectly happy with his body. Nor is he going through some sort of trauma to decide whether to identify as male or female with all the sort of insecurity that that brings. Jesus is quite clear who he is. There's a complete match between his person and his body. You see, maybe a risen physical Jesus has actually got rather a lot of relevance to our world. To a world where we struggle with our bodily existence. So he knows who he is. And this very clearly is the same person that the disciples had known before. He's saying, look, it's, it's me, it's I myself, the person that you know. Now he's been transformed in some way. It appears that his, his, he, he manages to appear in what we know from other accounts was a locked room. So there's something a bit different about his body and yet it is the same person. So this is the same person who experienced life in our world, who knows what life is like. He had spent over half his life in manual labor as a carpenter. He had known the insecurity of no regular income. He had a traveling ministry where he often would not know where he would be sleeping next. He had no regular home. He had uh, disciples who, without being unkind, were a little bit useless, who very often didn't get it, who in many ways were not much help at all. He knew that. And in fact, he was actually betrayed by one of them, one of the people he had been closest to over his whole ministry. And then at the end of his life, he faces the injustice and corruption of those in power ganging up on him. But incredibly, though he'd been through all of that, he won. Because if the worst thing that your enemies can do is to kill you, what are they going to do when you're resurrected, when you come back to life? What else can you do? And this power that was seen there in, in Jesus' Jesus's resurrection is something the disciples had seen already before in his whole life and ministry. They'd seen him heal people, heal blind people. He'd paralyzed people, were um, enabled to walk with a word. People with life-threatening fevers were healed. Well, that's the sort of person you need, isn't it, in a virus pandemic? He cast out demons who were terrified of him. He fed vast crowds with just some scraps of food. And he wasn't someone that complained about the weather, or even tried to sort of mitigate some of the effects of the weather, he controlled the weather. And faced with a friend who had died and was buried, he speaks into the tomb 
and says, Lazarus, come out. It's the same person. And this same person before the disciples now was someone who had lived consistently with his own teaching. He'd confronted those who abused their power, often those with religious power, using that to abuse others. He confronted that. He saw through that. He welcomed the outcast, the despised. He undermined the racism of his own day against the Samaritans. He treated women as equals, equal partners in his kingdom. In fact, he's the only man ever to have treated women perfectly, even in private, even in his thoughts. He intervened to stop a woman being stoned. Well, isn't this the sort of person we need? You know, nothing overwhelmed him. This is the sort of person that would seem to be able to address the problems that we face, partly because he's so unlike us. You know, how do we account for the sort of, both the sort of bigness and the perfection of his character? Well, the only way to explain this is what was the great claim of the early church, including Jesus' own human brother, that he was the son of God. This is what Jesus himself says. Um, at the end of that passage we read, he talked about going, uh, sending what the Father has promised. He was going back to his Father. He was going to send the Holy Spirit. He is God, one with Father and Spirit. And the resurrection actually proves this. Um, Paul says in Romans 1.4 that he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. And this, this, the resurrection just fits with everything else we know about Jesus. Never think of the resurrection as sort of some sort of random, stunning miracle. This wasn't some event that happened to a random person. No, no, this, is, this was the sort of fitting climax of everything that had happened in Jesus' life. This was the, the, the person that was resurrected was the person who had been prophesied throughout the Old Testament and that had done things only God can do in his ministry on earth. So yes, it's an incredible claim. It's a mind-blowing claim. I had a friend at university that actually wouldn't become a Christian because he couldn't get his head around the idea of Jesus being God. And in some ways I had sympathy with him because it is, he understood what a massive claim this is. But I don't know how else we can explain what we find about Jesus. He is God made flesh. However incredible that may seem, it's the only way to explain the facts. And by God, we don't mean that Jesus was some sort of superhero or superman, but that he really was God, the creator of everything. The one who made this world, the one who made you, the one who is in control of this world, the one who is in control over your life. That means he's relevant. I mean, if you understand who Jesus is, of course he's relevant. But what about what he's done? Well, if you think about what we've just talked about, he's done rather a lot, hasn't he? Imagine all those things we've just talked about being listed on your CV. That would be quite something, wouldn't it? You know, creator of the universe, raised the dead, stilled the storm, most influential person in history. But of all those things that Jesus had done, what is it, as it were, that he is most proud of, if I can put it like that? What is it that he would point to as his sort of crowning achievement that brings him the most glory in the sense of showing most clearly the sort of person he is? Well, I think it's very clear what Jesus' answer to that would be. It was that he died on a cross. Very strange answer, it would seem, on the face of it. But look what he does when he meets the disciples. He says, look at my hands and my feet. He showed them his hands and his feet. We read John's Gospel, it's clear that he is 
referring here to the marks of his crucifixion in his hands and his feet and indeed his side as well. How on earth are we to understand this? These are not injuries that haven't healed properly. It's not that Jesus limped into the room wincing in pain, which is what you would do if this was just some natural healing process. His body was not in the same battered state as when it was taken down from the cross. This was a glorified body with no decay, no suffering. It was a body that would never die again. And yet, some, I don't know quite how to understand this, but some physical scar remains that points to his suffering on the cross. Why? When you've made everything else sort of perfect. Well, I think this is the reason. The cross was central to his identity as the Messiah, as the Savior. It was part of him, if you like. That experience was part, you could always say it had become part of him. It was central to who he was. Later in the Bible, he's depicted as a, a lamb who had been slain. This is central to who he is. It's the sort of physical evidence of the sort of Savior that he is. But why make such a big deal about crucifixion? Well, this was a fulfillment of God's plan. The plan that God had revealed in the Old Testament. He tells them everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. So the cross was not fulfilling the agenda of the Romans or the Jewish religious leaders. It was fulfilling God's agenda. Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, the promised king who would rescue his people by suffering and dying. How different is that to our world? How do empires exercise authority and power today? It's through force, it's through violence, it's through fear. Jesus' kingdom comes by sacrifice, by laying down his life in the place of others. It gets to the heart of who God is. God is giving himself. That's what grace means. And he's giving himself for his enemies. That is the most incredible thing. That is God's plan. That is what Jesus fulfills. That is the cross that shows the sort of God that Jesus is. But what did this achieve? What was this sacrifice for? Well, it provides forgiveness. Again, look at Jesus' own explanation. He says the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. He's clear that's what his role was as the Messiah. And then he says this, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Well, what's this forgiveness thing? When we say we need forgiveness, what do we need forgiveness for? We need forgiveness for things that are wrong, for things that are evil. And what Jesus identifies here as needing forgiveness is sin. And the sin, Jesus, what sin means that Jesus is talking about here is the rejection of God's rule. It is saying no to God. It is turning away from our creator, trying to live our lives and find life without God. It's fundamentally actually a hatred of God. So when God does actually show up, when Jesus appears, what happens to him? All the way through his life, he's rejected. Turns up in his own hometown preaches in the synagogue and they want to throw him off the cliff and that pattern is repeated through his life Jesus is rejected constantly as a threat that's why he's put on a cross and it was all driven by people who were very religious people who thought they were doing good by doing this they were the people that saw themselves as the moral guardians of society they, they would have said, you know, we're on the right side of history. But before you sort of turn the finger and, and, and say, well, look how bad those people were, 
look at what Jesus is saying here. He is saying this message of forgiveness is to go to all nations, beginning, but not ending, at Jerusalem. Yes, you begin, and this is remarkable, isn't it, with those who had crucified him in Jerusalem. That's where this message of forgiveness begins. But it doesn't end there. And this is where Jesus maybe gets a little bit too relevant for us. You see, there's no racism in this message. There's no inequality. Jesus is telling us here that we're all equally sinners. We're all equally needing forgiveness. This is a universal problem. It doesn't matter where you go on the planet. It doesn't matter how civilized, uncivilized, religious, educated, or whatever else. This is a universal problem. And let's just be clear on the language. When I say a universal problem, that means it includes me. It includes you. It includes every one of us. I am a net contributor to the sum total of sin in the world. There's no sort of sin offsetting. You know, we talk about carbon offsetting today. You know, you can offset your carbon emissions. Well, I'm afraid there's no way to do that with your sin. You can't make up for your sin in some way. We are all net contributors. And that's why Jesus starts with you. What you need is not fundamentally re-education. What you need is not fundamentally therapy. Nor do you fundamentally need sort of victim status. What Jesus says you need to do is to repent. That means to turn around. If sin is turning away from God, then repentance is about turning back to him and trusting in Jesus as your saviour. That's where forgiveness comes from. Now, all that list of problems I began with at the start and all the ones I didn't mention are ultimately due to human sin. That hatred of God that is sin is seen amongst us in hatred, abuse, and exploitation of people. And actually also the planet, the rest of creation that God has put us in charge of. If we're out of step with the creator, we end up abusing what he has given to us in the creation. And it's also a result of sin that we live in a world that is full of disaster and disease and death. Yes, including deadly viruses. And this is all a problem that we can't really handle. There's no vaccine for death. These are bigger things than we can handle. And even when we think about some of the social problems, understand this, we're not the first generation to say, it can't go on like this. You know, we really should do something about poverty. People have been saying that for decades, for centuries, for millennia. The poor are still here. You know, people have been saying before that women should be able to walk the streets safely. They should. But nothing's changed. People have said before, you know, you really need to stop the environmental damage. That isn't a new thing. But it's still happening. It seems for all that we say these things, for all that we want these things, we can't actually solve it. But, think of Jesus. Jesus has a track record of someone who can do these things, who can put things right. We've just looked at his life. So that sort of begs the question, well, what's he doing now? He did all that then when he was here on earth. So, so what now? And this is where we finish. Where is he going? Well, I'm going to point you to something that looks very ordinary, very insignificant. He took this fish and ate it in their presence. Jesus ate some food. Well, actually, there's a massive load of teaching lying behind that. This wasn't simply proving that he had a real body. 
I believe he was eating to sustain that body. He was going to carry on eating because he talks about eating going on in the new world that he is going to make. Food is not some incidental thing in our life. It is actually something wonderful that God has given that the risen Jesus even enjoys. What does that say in our world today? With all the issues that there are about food. Jesus ate. This was a body for the long term. And we often forget this. Jesus kept his body. It's not that he was raised to life and then said, okay, I'll leave this body now. I'll ascend to heaven spiritually. No, we, at the end of this chapter, we read about Jesus ascending to heaven in this same body. He keeps his body. He keeps this body forever. Because he's preparing to return. See, remember, he said this message of forgiveness needs to go out to all nations. He wants everyone to hear this. He wants, every, wants this message to go out across the world before he returns. And before he returns to earth in this same flesh, this same body. And that is when we will get the final answer to these problems that we started with. What we saw Jesus doing the, fir the sort of first time round when he was on earth is a sort of foretaste of what he's going to complete when he returns. So when he returns, he's going to come in judgment in the first place. He's going to bring justice. There will, we want an end to evil. Well, there will be an end to evil. Jesus will bring justice. And he will bring judgment wherever evil is found. There's no sort of partiality. There's no being let off, whether it's found in you, me, or anyone else. Jesus will do something about the evil in this world. Understand this, hell is not empty. If we reject his offer of forgiveness, hell is the place of justice where your sin is punished. There will be justice. And that paves the way for the second thing he's going to do, which is to bring about a new creation. This is going to be a place with no sin, a place where God is at the center and people are glad of that. It's going to be a place, this is where we get it, where we will eat and drink literally with this same Jesus. You know, the disciples there ate and drank with Jesus on that day of his resurrection. Well, that is something all Jesus' disciples are going to enjoy in the new creation. We're all going to be doing that then. It's going to be a place where all the damage of sin is undone. Death itself is destroyed. Again, Jesus' resurrection is the sort of foretaste of that. It's the guarantee of that. And just as Jesus restored people's bodies to wholeness when he healed people, so he's going to do that for all his people's bodies and indeed the whole planet. You know, we talk about the need to save the planet. Well, ultimately, only Jesus can save the planet. He is going to remake this world and restore it. Do you see how relevant Jesus is? It is all about him. I kept having the, these words from a Christmas carol coming in my head at this point. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in Jesus Christ. He is at the center of everything. So, Jesus is relevant because he's coming back. And that means he's going to meet you. This is not some general vague thing. Every single one of us are going to meet Jesus. And I mean by that, you are going to see, meet the exact same person that the disciples saw that night. With the same body, and it won't have aged, the same person who could say, it is I, myself. That's 
That is our future. Every single one of us will meet that same person. And if that's the case, or to question the relevance of Jesus, well, that's crazy. He's the sort of ultimate elephant in the room. If you come across that expression, that saying, well, I, I, I thought, well, how will I explain that saying? And I thought, well, let's, let's don't often go to Wikipedia, but let's, let's just see what it says here. And I thought, this actually nails it for how we need to understand Jesus. <clears throat> Explaining this expression, the elephant in the room, uh, is an English saying, for an important or enormous topic or question or controversial issue or person, I would add, that is obvious, that everyone knows about, but no one mentions. No one wants to discuss it because it makes them uncomfortable. Because it's personally or socially embarrassing, controversial and dangerous. Yes, Jesus is someone rather dangerous. He is the ultimate elephant in the room. We know he's there. We know in our hearts this is true, but we're trying to do everything we can to avoid it. Well, don't ignore Jesus. Don't pretend he isn't there. Turn to him. Tell him your need of forgiveness. Trust him. And then you will discover just how relevant he is. May you trust him today. Well, we're going to finish with a final song that um, puts some of this together of the hope that we can have in Jesus Christ when we trust him. So we're going to play this now and um, we, we can stand and reflect on these words now.
Thank you for those incredible words that death is not the victor that Jesus Christ is. We thank you that he has conquered the greatest enemy because he has died and paid for sin, that he is exactly the saviour that we need. Our prayer is that we would bow before him that we would rejoice in his presence because we have trusted in him as our saviour. We would see the amazing hope that we can have in him and to see that he is the answer to every problem, to every trial, every sorrow. May we come to him. May we come humbly. May we come repentant. May we come confessing our sin. And may we come finding life in him. Thank you for this message. Thank you for this saviour. May we respond to this today. For we ask it in his name. Amen.